And so as we consider the issue here, we want to appreciate some introductory thoughts, uh, just kind of basic things. I hope you can read, can you read that, can, can you read that okay? It's a little bit of an eye t chart for people, sorry about that. Uh, but the Bible's message is good news, not merely good advice. Uh, it's authoritative truth and not creative suggestions. This is a very important matter. When we study the Word of God, we study it as authoritative truth. When we teach the Word of God to our children, or even reminding ourselves, or whatever it may be, uh, teaching classes, and some of us will be teaching publicly, uh, we want to understand we're teaching authoritative truth. Uh, and therefore, it is a genuine responsibility before the Lord. So workmen would need not be ashamed uh, that we would do it in a way that's pleasing to the Lord, accurate to the scripture, uh, and therefore honoring to his name. Uh, biblical teaching is not a book report, uh, but a bold assertion of what is actually stated in the text. After we go through a series of classes on how to prepare and present the word, each person will give a five-minute sermon. You say, well, I'm not sure I could stop in five minutes. Let us help you with that. <laughs> We're good at stopping things. Now, I may not be smart, but I can stop. You know, it's like that. So uh, each person will learn so they can actually present a five-minute sermonette as such. Uh, it'll be really exciting and wonderful and joyous, and I'm always edified. Uh, it's amazing what people are able to do. Uh, by the end of this class, you'll all be able to handle it much more uh, adequately than you may imagine for yourself. Uh, in colonial America, no one likes long-winded speakers. Too bad. Uh, in colonial America, uh, the average sermon was 90 minutes long. Uh, a 70-year-old believer would have heard about 7,000 sermons and would have had enough for a couple of master's degrees. Uh, but they were very literate on the scriptures uh, and therefore able to handle the word of God accordingly. Uh, in our society, most people like things bullet-pointed, you know, uh, just kind of summarized and whatever. Uh, but honestly, we shortchange ourselves. Many of us don't have the discipline. Uh, by the way, we have chairs in the front for people who want to take notes. It'll be very difficult on your lap to take notes. The chairs are available for you. We have about, a, there's a good eight chairs available for people if you want to sit at the table and take notes. Otherwise, well, however. In any case, um, don't, you'll be shortchanging yourself if you're not gaining the discipline to understand a sermon and follow the train of thought from how the Word of God is taught. Uh, and if your train of thought is basically uh, limited to a YouTube video, you're going to find yourself basically unable to pay attention on the very things that the Scriptures have for us. Now you can sit right next to your wife. Isn't that marvelous? Yeah. What a wonderful husband-wife opportunity. Uh, as we consider uh, the issues moving on, we want to remember that we don't teach our opinions, our beliefs, or concerns. We teach what the Holy Spirit placed into the scripture. And let me just explain that, if I might. If you're not properly disciplined, in preparing the Word of God, as we'll be going through it, you'll end up putting into it what you think already. Uh, and that way you become rather boring, because almost all of your teachings follow a certain idea. Uh, but you have to teach the full counsel of God. You have to understand the full counsel of God. And therefore, you have to understand it's not your opinions, it's not even your beliefs. You say, well, hold it a second. Well, I believe it's important. I know. I understand that. Certainly. That's not, we're not saying it's not important. 
What we are saying is that you're not merely to shove your beliefs into whatever sermon you feel like giving. You have to teach what the Bible actually says, what it says. Now let me explain a little further. When the Holy Spirit gave us the scriptures, he already placed in the very words that were inspired, he placed in those words the very truth he wanted us to have. And so we want to appreciate together a very simple fact about that matter. And say, well, when you really become a great teacher and you become a, you know, a, a, that kind of thing, uh, isn't it kind of like the, the Holy Spirit gives you things beyond that? Never. The Holy Spirit does not give you things beyond the scriptures. Uh, we read, and I'll just quote for you for the sake of time, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 6, Paul tells the Corinthians that they are to learn not to go beyond what is written. You're in dangerous ground when you start coming up with things and you say, well, the Spirit showed me something else. We don't want something else. The scripture itself contains the truth of God, what God wants us to have. And therefore, we will learn how to properly uh, understand the text, the scriptures itself, in order to teach the truth it contains. Now, if you know the word of God very well, you'll find as you're teaching scripture, other scriptures will reinforce and expand on the very things that it says here. But it'll always be from the word of God as opposed from a creative idea you had. Uh, and I not want to discount creativity, but as a substitute for accuracy, it leads to heresy. So be accurate with the scripture, rightly dividing the word of truth as we read uh, from 2 Timothy 2.15. And so we want to appreciate that. Let me also say, uh, most English Bibles are just fine. Some are better than others because they're more literal. Some are just more literal. In other words, uh, the King James uh, for the Old English is generally a very accurate translation. New King James is generally a very accurate translation. The New American Standard is a very accurate translation. Uh, the English Standard Version right, ESV, is very accurate as well. The Tree of Life version, what I've read of it, it's a new translation. I haven't had a chance to read it all the way through, but what I've read so far seems like a very good translation as well in English. And so trust those versions, but also have more than one. Uh, some, you're going to find that in some, sometimes the translators uh, play fielder's choice uh, in their translation of words. And so you want a few English translations for your study, uh, or Russian, as the case may be. Uh, uh, they, have, they have another Russian version now, don't they? There's, there's modern Russian versions now, right? So you're not stuck with the old Russian one, okay. But nonetheless, it's like the old King James. Uh, but in any case, uh, you want to have a few versions uh, for yourself and not be just limited to what one version says. For instance, the New International Version, it's, it's a fine translation, but it's much more of a dynamic translation, uh, closer to a paraphrase. They tried to make it very easily understood by American uh, and English readers. Uh, so some of the things are not as literal as might be helpful for you. Uh, and so, but most English translations would be just fine, uh, be very wise on that fact. Uh, moving on, I want to mention some scripture. We'll I'll take a look rather quickly, uh, which is foundational for this course. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, all scriptures inspired of God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, uh, that the people of God may be complete thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so uh, we want to understand that the provision for our lives are found in the scripture itself. All scripture are, are two things. Uh, all scripture are two things. What are the two things uh, in that phrase that tells us what scripture is? Anyone can yell it out? What's the one thing? Inspired and what? And profitable. Both things are true. 
it's as profitable as it is inspired. And so there may be portions you don't understand. Well, there's things I'm still growing into. But it is profitable. And when he said all scripture, he wasn't just talking about the new covenant writings. He was talking about all that is written as the word of God. He especially meant, at the point at the time he was writing this, he especially meant the Hebrew scriptures. Uh, and therefore, they are both inspired and profitable. And I trust that your studies will help bring that out, the profitability of the matter. And so the scripture itself is the provision for our lives. There's a process of growth that he brings up. It's profitable for teaching, for reproof, which means warning, for correction, which means a kind of a course adjustment kind of thing, and for training in righteousness, for teaching. In other words, if you do not know what the Bible says about prayer, but you only know prayer from traditional background, you don't know what prayer is about. In other words, what prayer is is what the Bible says it is. It's not something that I, I grew up in an orthodox Jewish environment. And so we had certain prayers, prescribed prayers. Uh, and if back in the day, someone said, what are prayers? I always said, Baruch HaTod, and I could mention, I could quote a bunch of prayers. Uh, read in Hebrew. Uh, but that's not what the Bible talks about as prayers. Uh, so we want to understand what prayer is from the scriptural point of view, because that's what the Bible's about. When someone thinks, well, what is God about? And someone says, well, I think he's like my grandfather who kind of always pinched my cheek, and when I did something wrong, he said, oh, you're too cute to punish. Yeah, well, that's not God. So you need to understand who God is from the scriptures, not from what your grandfather did or didn't do, etc. And so all of our knowledge about God's life for us, the spiritual, all spiritual matters are going to come from the scripture. That's where the teaching is found. For reproof, for warning, it lets us know when we're off course. It'll tell you that, you know, that's wrong. Well, the guy started it first. Yeah, but you're a believer, and you're to bless those who curse you and curse not. And so the Bible says, you don't do that. And then also for correction, uh, for growth, uh, for cost correction, so to speak, improvement and development, having a better way to do it. Uh, there was a, a, a man I was discipling in New York City. Uh, in Yiddish, we say it was Chaya. Uh, an animal, a tough guy, you know, uh, a Jewish kind of tough guy. And so he came to faith in Messiah, and I taught him about sharing his faith. And so the following week, uh, I said to him, well, did you have a chance to share your faith? He said, yes, I did. I said, well, how did you do that? He said, well, I took a guy at work, I held him up against the wall, and I shared the Messiah with him, and then I let him go. I said, okay, you're going to improve on that right now. And he needed some improvement, some correction, you know. He had to find a better way to do it than that. Uh, in his environment, he thought he was doing a good deed. He was kind of making a mess. That can happen, but the Bible improves us. And then it says, for training in righteousness. Uh, anyone here ever play sports in uh, high school or college or something? Uh, what sport did you play, Greg? You played football. Okay. What position did you play? Linebacker. Okay. I'll keep that in mind. Um, you, you were a linebacker too, Gary? Okay. Uh, the whole front row is linebackers. I'm in trouble. Uh, when you were being taught to be a linebacker, being coached, did they just show you once and then that was it? Did you have to do things a lot over and over again? Yeah. And training in righteousness has to do with the disciplines of being a mature believer. In other words, we'll be learning certain skills that will do you no good unless they become a discipline, unless they become almost like a second nature behavior kind of thing, like learning a language, 
uh, so that you be able to understand what the scripture says. And so it's not just learning skills, it's a training in righteousness over and over and over and over and over again. And so I hope following this seminar, you will take what you learned and over and over again, keep up on your skills so you'll learn the disciplines and be able to properly teach at a moment's notice. When I teach leaders, I have leadership training in different parts of the world, I teach young leaders that they have to be ready to pray, preach, or die at any time. And so they say, well, hold, how do you mean preach at any time? Yeah, we have to know the Word of God well enough and being able to properly divide it so you're able to come up and teach as the occasion calls for you to teach. If you're going to take two months before you can do something, uh, the opportunity may have come and gone by then. And so we learn skills that become disciplines. The, in other words, prayer needs to be a discipline so that you pray automatically. Uh, that you're not waiting until it's so bad you have to pray. Don't worry. God needs to hear from you. He can make it so bad in order to pray. Uh, but we want to understand all of the areas that we grow in have to be disciplines of our life, spiritual disciplines. And then, of course, the product. What's the result? He says that the people of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work in, in the Greek all is the same word as every. So you have all scripture, every good work. To the degree you have all scripture as profitable, to that degree you are prepared for every good work. This is God's goal for each one of us. And so we want to just understand that going into this, uh, that the goal is our growth in him, our spiritual growth. You say, well, won't I spiritually grow if I don't learn how to handle the scriptures? No. No, it's like saying you need someone to feed you because you can't cut your own meat. If you're just used to going to a place of worship and merely getting a, your teaching once a week or something like that, you're shortchanging yourself. You're stunting your own growth. You should be praying, give me this day our daily bread. Uh, so you want to be fed in the word of God and learn how to feed yourself in these matters. We want to now quickly take a look at where this whole course comes from, the whole seminar comes from. It comes from a study in Ecclesiastes 12, 9 through 12. Uh, if you have your own Bible, you can follow along if that's helpful to you. I'll have the scriptures up there, but maybe an eye chart for some people. And so the work of preparation in verse 9, in addition to being a wise guy, you know, a wise man, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, and he pondered and searched out and arranged many proverbs. Preparation is for people. What we do, it's like being a mom at home. You cook, but not just for yourself. You cook for the family. That's just normal. And so we want to understand that for those who are in any sort of uh, leadership in the home or in the congregation or wherever, you have a responsibility uh, to, to teach for others. But first, it has to be for yourself. In addition to being a wise person, what does that mean? Wisdom is the application of biblical knowledge. Wisdom is the application of what the scriptures say. It's always the application. Wisdom is not just insight. Insight will kill you if you don't apply it. Insight will just distract you. Uh, you'll gain some insight, and you'll think, wow, that was really interesting. That was unusual. That was a whole new take on something. Big deal. We have to grow into what is always true. Uh, but it also says the preacher also taught the people knowledge. So you have to feed yourself from your own study, and you have to be able to teach others as well. Uh, this is actually where we grow. We do a lot of discipleship in this particular congregation, but I have found that people don't become disciples until they start discipling others. Have you found that to be true, Gary? The more you disciple others, the more you're grounded in the truth itself uh, for yourself. And so we want to understand, we learn for ourselves, but we're only wise for, if we're only wise for ourselves, we're really not wise. Because what we learn from the scripture for application is that we have to care about others. 
In other words, what the scripture is teaching us is not to become a holy hermit sitting up in our little man cave or woman cave or whatever and kind of living a spiritual life of sorts uh, in regards to, you know, what's on the internet or something. We have to interact with other people. We have to love other people, care about other people. And so we are not just to find truth for ourselves. You really haven't applied it to your life until you share it with others. And then you're going to find that it's really going to help you be edified and grow. And it says we have to be not only preparations for people, but preparation is by pursuing. He says here three things in that verse. One, he pondered. He observed very carefully the text. We're going to go into that in the next half hour uh, quite a bit. He pondered. He thought about things. He looked at it, just like we're going to go over about how to look at the scripture, how to study it for ourselves. And then it says there he searched out. He did a lot of homework. I bet he studied his Bible more than you know, he may have studied his own proverbs. Wouldn't that be funny? Uh, but nonetheless, he probably, you know, the prophets probably wondered more about their prophecies. Uh, we read in First Peter about that. And so they really searched out the meaning of things. And that's what we're going to learn together about searching out the meaning. By the way, there are chairs, two chairs at the front row here, if anyone wants those two chairs. And there's still a chair there and a chair there. I just want you to be able to take notes, otherwise it's just so hard. In any case, <clears throat> thirdly, it says he arranged many proverbs. Arranged. And that's the idea of putting it into a logical format. Now, for some of us, we may not be well read in the scriptures. That's okay. We all have long, further to go than we have thus far come. That's all right. But let's understand together uh, the fact that the Bible is actually logical. The Bible is written in a rational way. It's not illogical or irrational. It's not merely a bunch of mysticism kind of irrational things that you kind of, you have to be especially attuned to understand or gain. That's not the Bible. That's not what the Bible says about itself. And so we want to understand the very fact that what God inspired, listen carefully on this point. God inspired words. I like art, but he didn't, there's not one picture in the Bible he inspired. I like music, but all we have are the lyrics from David's songs. We don't how, know how it went, you know? It's the words that are inspired. Think about that. What he inspired were the words. And therefore, it's the study of the words that give you the word inspire, uh, theonisto in the original, breathe, God breathed. God is breathing into your soul as you study his word as you ponder, as you organize, as you work through the text. The Holy Spirit is now taking what he taught in that word, and as you're studying through it, he is now speaking to your heart, breathing into you, uh, encouraging you, and helping you. This is how he actually teaches it in the scripture itself, as, as we've seen. In any case, uh, the work of preparation. Work of presentation, verse 10 in Ecclesiastes 12. Verse 10 says the preacher sought to find delightful words uh, and to write words of truth correctly. And so let's understand applicable words uh, are delightful, practical, creatively presented. Accurate words, he said delightful words, you know, meaning applicational issues. Accurate words to write words of truth correctly. You know, the, uh, men like Solomon, David, David knew the word of God backwards and forwards when he wrote Psalm 119. It's kind of a, uh, a summarization of the Torah. Uh, the whole Torah is found in Psalm 119. Uh, in any case, these men knew the word of God and knew it well. And all the teachings they gave were reflective of what the scriptures were saying. And so we want to understand uh, accurate words written to objectify, correct, 
and written out. We're going, you're going to be wanting to take notes. You say, well, I take mental notes. I'm not going to judge you for that, but my own experience for myself, when I take mental notes, the eraser is bigger than the pencil. And so here today and gone tomorrow. That's why I like people to sit comfortably and take notes and be able to figure out what the, what's going on. Written object to objectify the truth. You're writing it down. Words of truth that reflect the character of God. You have to be very careful with God's word because it is a, the Bible is a revelation of God and what he thinks about everything. Whatever he, want, whatever he wants to say to us is his perspective and it's a revelation of himself. And so we want to appreciate, in other words, people are creating the image of God. That's why we need to show due respect. Everything in creation is reflective of him. And that's what Paul says in Romans chapter 1 and verse 20, uh, that by uh, the powerful things around us, volcanoes and tornadoes, he's teaching us through all sorts of things. Even as Yeshua said, study the ravens and take a look at the birdies and look at the tulips and lilies of the field and other things like that. Uh, because God has them here as lessons for us. And so we want to appreciate that the scripture especially is written in order for us to understand God more, more ca carefully and accurately. And to be accurate regarding God's will. In other words, people often say to me, how can I know God's will? Well, God's will is in his word. And if you don't know his will, if you don't know his word very well, you end up flipping coins or things like that. If it's heads, I marry her. If it's tails, I don't. Sorry, babe, can't marry you. Came up tails, you know. Uh, so you're going to be making decisions, and sometimes uh, you say, well, I thought the Lord led me. He may have, and may, many times he's very gracious towards us. He may lead you because you don't know the word of God well enough to figure out how to make wise decisions. And so he is gracious towards us. But as you mature in the word of God, you start to understand what, what the primary matters of your life and faith are, what are secondary matters, how to use liberty to the glory of God, uh, etc. These are all things the Bible teaches us as we study it carefully and accurately. Uh, in regards to appropriation, it says in verse 11, the words of the wise are like goads, and the masses' collections like well-driven nails. They are given by one shepherd. The whole Bible is written by one author. Many different Many of you may have different color pens. You want to mark things a different color. Well, that's how the Bible is, too. You have David with a passionate color, and then you have Paul, and very analytical and different things. But nonetheless, one shepherd. And so uh, first thing he says in regards to that is that they're like goats. They are meant to motivate. When we teach the word of God, we teach it so people will be motivated to follow the word of God like goading them on, encouraging them, exhorting them, and we'll, we'll study those things and learn how to do it. Uh, clarify, uh, like uh, well-driven nails. Uh, they focus to live steadfast like a nail. You can hang your coat on a nail and it just stays there. Well-driven nails to live steadfastly like a carpenter's weld. You don't want to ask me to nail in nails. It looks like abstract art. And, but, a good carpenter, they nail it in straight and true and everything. Uh, and so when we teach the word of God, that's how we do it. Uh, straightforward, steadfast, understandable on what the Bible is teaching. Uh, glorify, they unify to live honorably. Uh, the shepherd is honored in everything we do. It's all from one shepherd. Uh, you may be teaching from David or Moses or Paul, uh, but it's all to the glory of our great shepherd, uh, the good shepherd, our Messiah, indeed. And so like a shepherd gathering a flock together, you're gathering all these ideas you're going to have and putting them into some kind of logical format so we can follow along, and that's what we'll be doing to the glory of God. And something else here to be understand is some limitations. Uh, verse 12 says, but beyond this, my son, be warned, the writing of many books is endless. 
Excessive devotion to books is wearying to the body. The work is not to be endless. Land the plane. Land the plane. I'm so glad Shabbat comes when it does so I can finally stop writing. <laughs> Otherwise, I would keep studying the same portion for years on end because it's like a, you know, a bottomless well of joy in, for my life. But I have to land the plane. I'm going to have to teach the word. And so keep that in mind. Land the plane. And the work is not to be exhausting. You say, what do you mean? Study for application. If you keep in mind that the Bible is to be applied and not merely understood, you will be focused on the issue and not exhaust yourself on going hither and yon on all sorts of things. You say, well, what do you mean? The Bible says this. This is what Yeshua said. John 13, 17. If you know these things, blessed are you who do them. The blessing is in the application. You say, but I get such insight and really encouraged when I study. I'm sure you do. But the blessing is in the application, regardless of how lovely it was to study it and things like that. The actual blessing from God. You've got to be careful, because some of us can get excited about new insights and all. Be careful of stopping there. Application is where the blessings are found. And so the work of the wise disciple is to make wise disciples who work. We put it into practice. We help people to grow in our homes, in our community, wherever the Lord would have us. Okay, so we saw from the introductory thoughts, 2 Timothy 3, the inspired authority is in the text itself. The text itself is what the Holy Spirit wants us to understand and teach. As we saw for Ecclesiastes, this is the basis. Uh, what's going on here? Something wrong with the battery. Okay. Basis of what we'll be studying. We're now going to go into your outline. At the end, I will be taking a few minutes uh, to... Well, there you go. Someone who knows the switch. Thank you very much, Barry. For those live streaming from home, I just thank Barry for turning on the switch. Um, at the end, we'll take a few minutes for Q&A on things. I talk fast, uh, and I talk long, and I try to talk loud. Uh, if any of that confuses you, bring it up at the end. Write down your questions. We'll have a time of Q&A. Uh, this first class is going to be a little longer than the others to make sure we get through the issue of observation because your homework for next week will be on the matter of observation. You say, what am I observing? You're going to find your favorite verse, and you will be using that as the text to study from for the whole course. You say, well, can I have a few texts? It'll just drive you mad. I don't, it may not be a long drive for you, but you want to be able to understand the process this is a process we're learning, a, a skills for discipline that we are learning. This is, uh, if you're going to go from verse to verse, you'll do different things and you'll probably confuse yourself. Find one verse for your study. You say, can I do two verses? If you've taken, how many people here have taken this course before? Raise your hand. It's really wise to take this over and over again. It's like learning a language. There's a whole lot. Uh, Lisa, there are chairs up here, by the way, sister. I'm just saying. I always get those one looking for chairs. There are chairs. In any case, um, observation is something that you'll be doing for the rest of your life. If you learn it, you, you, it's like you can't stop observing. It's some, a discipline that we learn. But in any case, find one. You say, well, I was, there's a really hard verse. I really wanted to study. Have it your way, but it may not be a fun time for you. It may be hard for a very good reason, and you may need to learn some skills and get disciplined the skills before you tackle the deep end of the pool in the hardest verse. You may want to start off with a simpler verse and realize how the skills that you need to develop for every other verse. It'll be the same skills for whatever verse of scripture or chapter or whatever you're teaching. First thing, read what is there. Read what is there. You say, duh, 
Yeah, I know. Most people read too fast. Uh, most people are not good at the Bible because lear they've learned to read from newspapers or the internet, which is usually written at a sixth grade or seventh grade level. Uh, newspapers, I was a journalist major. Uh, newspapers are sometimes not for you know, adult reading, it's supposed to be really simple so people can, everyone can read it. But the Bible actually expects you to carefully read it. The Bible assumes you will carefully read it, especially when you read some of the teachings of Paul. It is so packed, it takes so much unpacking that you have to really spend a little bit of time thinking through what he is saying and the words that he uses and things like that. And so read what is there. Even as we looked at 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16 and 17, all scriptures inspired of God and profitable for teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness, that the person of God will be complete, fully equipped for every good work. And so we want to understand, read what's there, understand what's there. Uh, you say, what do you mean? Well, as I noted before, and I reiterate at this point, what you're reading is the inspired words. It doesn't become inspired when you understand it. It may be more encouraging and edifying for you if you understand it, but it's already inspired. The scripture is already inspired by the Holy Spirit. It's already inspired, and all the words as such as I noted, each of them therefore have something to say to us. Uh, read scripture slowly. Read scripture slowly. You say, well, what do you mean read scripture slowly? Uh, for those who are learning the skills and discipline, I would say uh, read, if you're going to be teaching a verse from a particular uh, let's say a particular book of the Bible, uh, read the verse for every, read the book that it's contained in for as many chapters as is in that book. So you get an overview of what the book is about because the scripture you're reading, the particular scripture, is written in context to the rest of the book. And so you need to have an overview of what the whole cotton picking book is talking about. And therefore, it'll be helpful when you start to look at that verse. And so a text taken out of context becomes a pretext for any subtext. You want to drive through it. And so you want to understand the text in its context. In other words, what it means, it means what it means in the context in which it was written. And so we want to appreciate that as we study. And you want to then, you say, well, what else do I have to read? Then read uh, that verse for as many verses as there are in that chapter. What? Well, what if there's 30? What if there, what do you mean? Yeah, read that chapter a whole lot for as many verses as in that chapter. Just keep reading that chapter. Understand the, the initial, the immediate context. Then read the verse. Then you're ready to get to the verse. Then read that verse uh, as many times as there are words in the verse. You say, you expect us to do a lot of reading. Not me. God. He expects us to take his word seriously. He wrote it so we would take it seriously. And therefore, there is a discipline to maturity. Maturity in the faith doesn't just happen because of tenure because of time. It comes because you apply the truth of God's word to your life consistently. And so these become disciplines and you grow consistently. And so you want to have the discipline of reading scripture. Now some of us will be arrogant. It's going to happen. <laughs> I read the Bible once. Don't worry about it. I got the whole thing nailed. Fine. Uh, that's okay. Uh, but we want to appreciate that many of us are not that familiar with scripture. We need to understand the text in light of its context. Uh, very important for that. And so reading it over and over again as well as slowly uh, is very important. Use several translations. Take a look at that verse in different translations. Take a look at the, the chapter or even that book of the Bible in different translations. Uh, you say, why? Because you may realize that 
uh, that there was a different slant on certain ways they, they worded things. Uh, you say, well, which one's right and which one's wrong? You're going to find that in translations, uh, some words, uh, in order to translate into another language, sometimes has certain nuances, certain facets to a word. Uh, and so when you translate it into English, there may be different ways to say the same thing. Uh, and there may be slightly different nuances that are given in different translations. So that could be helpful to you when you study. Read what is there. For next week, you'll be doing a lot of reading. You say, what else? A lot of writing. Writing? Yes. You're going to write, you're going to note, you're going to observe what's in the scripture. You're going to observe what is in that scripture. You say, well, what do you mean? This is what I mean precisely. You're going to notice the structure of the scripture. And you'll look at the fact of how it is organized. Uh, you know, is it, uh, does it have a, a subject? Does it have a verb or action? You say, well, it always has a subject. It's not always that clear. And when you read commands, there's no subject. Because a command is always you. It's just implied. So you'll read a command, it'll just be a, you know, stop. It doesn't have a subject. It, it's impl the implication is you stop. <laughs> uh, but you have to understand what the structure is. Uh, because you may misunderstand it otherwise. And for those of us, like, there may be some here like myself, when I was in high school, I did not know the Lord. You can imagine what's coming next. And therefore, I took English classes in order to pick up girls. That's what I thought the whole benefit of English class. So I didn't pay attention and even stay awake through most of this stuff in high school. I am sorry now. After I came to faith, I realized the important thing to read was the Bible. Then I had to pay attention and figure out stuff. Uh, it would have been easier if I stayed awake in high school, just saying, and learned about subjects and verbs, but mostly I was interested in the different ladies who were in the classes there. Didn't help me whatsoever. They were less interested in me than I should have been in English. So, what's the structure? How is it organized? You want to be thinking, what is the verb? You say, what in the world is a verb? It, two things, one of two things. It shows an action, some activity. Shows action. Johnny ran to the store. What's the verb in that sentence of Johnny ran to the store? What's the verb? Ran. Who, you, you're all one. See, it's, it's that hard. You'll be able to do it. It's really not that hard at all. But you just have to pay attention and observe what it says. You say, it's important to know what a verb is. The Holy Spirit thought so. The Holy Spirit thought he'd put verbs and, and nouns and all sorts of different things. And he expects us to understand it that way. And so, uh, or it could be is or are, A-R-E, and that is a state of being. You know, just a state of being. Uh, and so we want to appreciate, uh, you know, uh, Sam is good-looking. I'm not saying we're Sam, but... And so is is the verb, a state of being. He is. He was never good-looking before. He may not be good-looking in the future, but he is now. It's present tense, so I, I'm presently good-looking. Also, unable to see very well. But, uh, so, so you may look at the verse, and it may have an is or are, and understand it's talking about state of being, okay? And so you want to then be thinking about the subject and the object of the verse. So when we say that Johnny ran to the store, okay? What, what is the subject of that sentence, Johnny ran to the store? What is it? Johnny. It's about John. It's all about John. If your name is Johnny, this is not the Holy Spirit trying to tell you to run to stores or something. So... It's about Johnny. That's what the subject of it's about. In other words, what is the whole verse about? It's about Johnny. You say, I thought it would be about the store. No, that's where he ran to. <laughs> that's the object. 
the fact that he went somewhere, store is where he went. But it's about Johnny going to, it's not about the store, it's about Johnny running to the store. So when you think of what is this verse about, it's about the subject of the verse. So when you understand what the subject is, you appreciate what the verse is about. You see? It'll be easy, really easy when you just think about it that way. And so we think, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, uh, whosoever believes in... What's the subject of the verse, John 3, 16? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall perish for everlasting life. What's the, ver what's the subject? God. You say, well, hold it, wasn't it about the son? No, no. That's, no, it's about God, he giving his only begotten son. God saying, anyone who believes in him shall not perish. It's about God. And so, but if you misunderstand that, you end up with all kinds of things that may not be what the text is saying. Okay? So you want, it takes a little bit of thought. Especially if you're used to hearing things, you don't often think about what they're saying. You know, John 3, 16. You know, whoever thought about breaking that down, looking that up, and stuff like that. And so the object uh, of it, God so loved the world. The world is his object. You say, what? Yeah, he's looking at you. It's about you. God so loved the world. Then what he did for the world has to do with Messiah. But it's, the object is the world. He, he loves us so much. That kind of thing. He so loved the world. And so that would be the object of what is the subject trying to accomplish or do or get around or whatever. That kind of thing. Adjectives and adverbs. Adjectives and adverbs, uh, they are modifiers. They modify something. So, I'm going to now say that sentence with an adjective. Johnny went to the big store. What was the adjective? Big. You say, is that important? Yeah, it, it modifies the kind of store. And that might be very important if you had to understand the whole matter. Johnny went to the dollar store. Okay, he's not doing so well, so okay. And so it tells me something about Johnny, you know, kind of a frugal kind of boy, okay. Uh, but nonetheless, the adjective will give you information that's very helpful. Or old Johnny ran to the store. Wow, old Johnny can still run. Isn't that something? Even though he's old, an adjective. Uh, old Johnny ran quickly to the store. What is quickly? Pardon me? Adverb, because it modifies the verb. How did he run? He ran quickly. And if he's old Johnny running quickly, he's in better shape than young Sam, I'll tell you that. And so we want to just note for yourself. You say, is it important? It's important for you to observe it and write it down. Because what you'll be getting out of the text will come from your understanding of the words in that text. And if you don't understand the words in that text, you'll never understand the meaning of the text. And you'll come up with your own meanings like, I really think that all people should run to stores because Johnny did it, we should all run. What? <laughs> you gotta be careful about coming up with assumptions that may not be what the text is teaching. Or I think that God wants me to buy a store. That's because Johnny ran to a store. I had a store. I was thinking, what should I do when I grow up? I'm gonna buy a store. I'm gonna build a store even. I, no. no, it's not about you building a store. It's about Johnny running to a store. Ran, ran quickly, he was old, big store, whatever. Okay. So you have to just notice and note what they are. Just observe. What, you don't have to say, this means that we're all to buy stores. All you have to say is that store, a noun, is a noun and the object of the sentence. It's a noun. It's an object of the sentence. Uh, and so that's all you have to do for your homework. You don't have to come up with insights about it. You don't have to give me all sorts of what it means. You're not going to go there. We will go there. And believe me, we will be going there. And you will be drawing out from what you observe insights about the text, from what it is saying. 
You say, is this, do people do these things? I do it every week. I do this every week. Now I've done it quite often, so I do these things pr rather quickly, but I do it every week. Prepositions. Prepositions. Preposition. Johnny ran to the store. To, T-O, is the preposition. It locates the action. Johnny ran around the store. Why, didn't he like the store? I don't know. But it's a different preposition, but it tells you something different about the action. Johnny ran in the store. Well, not just to the store. Now he's running into the store. Johnny ran through the store. Whoa, <laughs> he's on a roll here. And he didn't just run to the store, not just in the store, but right through the store. Johnny ran out of the store. <laughs> As Johnny has a whole life of running. Uh, but nonetheless, all those different words are prepositions, and they, tell, they help you locate the action. They'll help you define what the action is about in that regards. And so you'll just note those things, okay? Connectives. And is a connective. It connects two things. Johnny and Pete ran to the store. He, finally, he has a friend. I guess go to the store enough, you get friends. In any case, and is the connective. It connects them together. Now, both of them are the subject. Johnny and Pete, okay? Johnny ran to the store and the market. Two objects, he ran to the store, ran to the, this guy is running all over the place. And is a connective. Uh, but, you see but in the center, it's kind of contradicting or contrasting but it's a connective, it's connecting uh, these things. We want to appreciate uh, the matter uh, and, and understand that you're going to be noting these matters and these connectives. Uh, when you see sometimes F-O-R, it shows reason. Um, let me ask you a question. Why is John 3.16 in the Bible? Say, because God won the Bible. Sure, I know that. But from the verse, can you tell me why John 3.16 is in the Bible? Has to, I'll give you a hint. It has to do with a connective. Marinella? Yeah. For God so loved the world. It's explaining verse 15. It's in the Bible to explain the previous verse. That's why John 3.16 is in the Bible. And we know that because for God so loved the world. It's explaining why God did what he did in verse 15. You see? Uh, so if you understand these connectives, it's helpful. Therefore, therefore, it tells you what it's there for. Shows the result and conclusion. So when you see therefore, you want to realize it is concluding what was previously said. It's summarizing, bringing it all together. Therefore, go punch Johnny in the nose. He keeps running through the store, doesn't buy a blessed thing here. Punch that. Therefore, punch him in the nose. So, a result. What, what happens when you run through stores all the time? Don't buy anything? Get punched in the nose. That's the result. Okay. And that's how you, when you read your scripture, you see the word therefore, you'll want to see what it's there for. It is a result, conclusion of previous action as such. And so we want to uh, uh, ask yourself simple questions. You know, what was the subject of this sentence? Uh, what is the action of this sentence, you know, of the subject? Uh, or what is the object of it? God so loved the world, right? Uh, and we want to be asking Ask those, write down those things. This is the subject, this is the verb, this is the action, all those things. That's your homework for next week. As we consider uh, the form, when you have, uh, there's different forms in the scriptures. There's the apocalyptic. 
You say, what in the world does that mean? Revelatory. It means revelatory. The book of Daniel, the book of Revelation, certainly much of Ezekiel, is apocalyptic. And when you have apocalyptic, you have a lot of metaphors, similes, symbols, a lot of symbols are used. Uh, and to interpret the symbols, you have to know the whole Bible, how the Bible uses those symbols. Uh, otherwise, you'll misunderstand what it's saying. The book of Revelation, we, we've studied the book of Revelation in our congregation. It's not hard to understand once you appreciate its apocalyptic literature and that the symbols have a meaning elsewhere in the Bible. Uh, Two-thirds of the scriptures in the book of Revelation are taken from or direct allusions to uh, the Hebrew text, the, the Hebrew scriptures. So if you know the whole Bible, the book of Revelation has all these symbols that it's now reiterating and using, and things like, like Jezebel and those kind of things. And so apocalyptic literature will have some uh, kind of symbolic things being tossed around, metaphors, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, yeah, epistles, these are letters, and they're written in letter form, very logical, analytical, kind of things. And if you don't study it for the form it is, you will probably misunderstand what you're reading. You have to understand it's, it's written in an analytical way, line upon line. Often you'll see Paul uh, say something, prove it, they have a therefore, over and over and over again. He writes in very analytical form. His writings were used in, uh, back in the early 1800s uh, when many schools were more Bible-oriented, his, his writings were used in, in law schools for teaching logic. Uh, so it's, that's how it's written. Narrative, this is stories. Uh, when you read about David and Goliath, that is a narrative, a story. And often when you uh, study a story, it's going to be a whole big kind of thing. It's a very interesting thing. I've taught narrative in Hope of Israel quite often. It assumes you know the Bible, and especially the Torah, uh, because there's going to be Torah principles that are going to be brought out in the narrative or the conflict with Torah principles. And it's like very interesting when you realize uh, that the narratives placed in the Bible are meant to tell stories illustrating or indicating from history uh, teachings from the Torah or from the teaching, when you read through the book of Acts, uh, the teachings of Messiah, and things like that. Uh, when you read like the, the narrative of uh, Hagar and Ishmael, if you remember, uh, in Genesis 16, you have to realize that is an illustration if you don't follow Genesis 2.24, that you're only supposed to have one wife. And Abraham gave in to his lust, his wife gave in to her guilt, and they both contradicted the scriptures, but they didn't follow Genesis 2.24. And so all of that is an outworking. Once you get that, you start understanding what these stories are trying to communicate. And so narrative is like that. And when you read through narrative and you read through the stories, sometimes you have to understand an atlas, know the places. You have to understand the characters being spoken about. Uh, so you may have to read the whole section about them, uh, uh, read about David. You have to know his whole life to appreciate some of the issues going on. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, they're always, it's always very interesting and great to study. Uh, and you want to realize that sometimes you read through like a whole chapter, uh, David and Goliath, and you come up with one big principle, you know. Uh, God is bigger than the problem, you know. <laughs> Everyone else is shaking their boots but David knew God is bigger than my problem. Uh, the whole chapter is written to reiterate and reinforce that one truth. God is bigger than our problems. And so the whole thing is that one truth there, reiterated, reinforced over and over again. And so when you read narratives, you have to be careful about the geography. Uh, many times that's important to the story. You have to understand who the characters are as well as understand subject and verbs and things like that. But the form will also be important to understand as well as the structure of the verse. A parable is uh, basically, it's a story of, uh, that compares matters. Yeshua 
uh, taught, you know, taught in parables. We studied uh, somewhat extensively a uh, number of his parables about the kingdom from Matthew chapter 13. Uh, and he was, uh, I just want to say Shalom Tony, just because I feel led to say Shalom Tony. For those live streaming, my dear friend Tony Mardian is on his way out to catch a flight. Good to see you, bro. In any case, a parable is a kind of a, uh, how can I even put it? It's like a, a, a story, uh, but it's always meant to illustrate a moral principle. There's something there, some moral principle it's trying to illustrate. And so you have to study it to say, what is the moral principle? And I've dealt with a number of people, uh, one of the planters, that uses my material. A uh, number of congregation planters use my material, uh, my sermons and things. And he called me up. He said I got some blowback on one of the parables uh, in, in Messiah's teaching about the parable of leaven because the people who he was teaching had learned in their church uh, that it meant that, uh, that the body of Christ would therefore explode and take over the world and everything else. And, uh, and we took a look at it and took a look what Yeshua said about the parables in that chapter and realized that that just could not be true. It certainly wasn't for that point. And because if you don't know what leaven is in the Bible, you will misunderstand its usage. Uh, the writers of scripture, and Yeshua especially, would use the word leaven very carefully uh, because everyone knew uh, it was a corrupting agent. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, etc. And so if you don't know these things and you read into it some grand idea, that's not what the text is saying. And so a parable, you have to carefully study it and understand what it's saying. It's a moral principle that's in there. Uh, poetry. Uh, I've been teaching, I will be teaching from the Psalms for the next uh, number of weeks. Uh, and so poetry uh, has to be understood uh, in the different ways. Uh, it is meant to really evoke uh, your emotions, to really help you understand uh, the whole issue. It's, for, it's wonderful for devotions. They often use, people use psalms for devotions uh, because it's so, it fills them with such emotional, you know, it really hits their feelings. Uh, and you want to, when you study it, realize that it will also stir your imagination. Uh, and when you read it, you have to appreciate things like metaphors, which is a direct comparison. Uh, I taught this past Shabbat from Psalm 120, verse 7, where the writer of the psalm says, I am peace. It sounds like a big thing. Well, that's a metaphor. Uh, like Paul Simon, I am a rock, I am an island. He really wasn't a rock, and he really wasn't an island. But poetically, he felt like a rock and felt like an isolated island, you see? And so the same thing, he says, I am peace. You have to understand it's a metaphor and understand it accordingly. What is he reflecting to? What's it speak to? How does it tie in scripture and things like that? So you have to understand metaphors. Uh, you'll see things that are similar to a metaphor. They're also comparisons. They're called similes, S-I-M-I-L-E. A simile has the word like or as. In other words, it compares to a certain detail about that matter. I am like an island. I am not an island. I just happen to be like it. Uh, I am as someone or whatever. But as and like uh, are similes. It's a very similar kind of thing in poetry. It's used quite often. Uh, and you want to understand that it's making comparisons. It's making comparisons in regards uh, to these kind of matters. Um, and you'll often find in poetry and also the Proverbs parallelisms. Uh, you'll find a lot of verses are written in parallel form, saying this, reiterating the same thing in another word, in other words, many times. Uh, and so a little bit slightly different trying to restate the very same idea, emphasizing it, therefore. And so you, when you, when, if you're going to be using uh, some of the Psalms, you want to be thinking, what emotions does this evoke? What feelings does this communicate? You know, is it joyous, right? Uh, is it sad? Is it uh, fearful? 
you know, you have to understand what poetry, inspired poetry as well, is trying to communicate. Now, when we deal with the issue of noting what's there, you want to now look at the key words in the passage. The key words in the passage. What are the... I'm going to stop here. It's uh, 10 after 8, uh, and they shoot horses, don't they? We'll stop here. Your homework is prior to this. You have to understand the form and observe what is in the structure. Your homework for next week is to understand what is the structure and what is the form. That's all you have to do. Very simple. It'll probably take you not much time. It'll be the reading that will take you more time, hopefully. Hopefully you put the reading in, understand the text and its context, therefore appreciate what's in that verse. Okay. Uh, we'll conclude that and go into the next matter as well. The Lord be pleased to allow us to. Uh, I'd like us to take some time for question and answers. Question and answers. Uh, if you have a question, I'll try to figure out an answer. Uh, maybe other people know more than me, but nonetheless. Uh, anything unclear? Anything you understand? What the, anybody understand what the homework is? Got it? You don't? Okay. The homework is find your favorite verse, read the context carefully, read that verse carefully, then figure out what the structure of that verse is and what the form of the verse is, whether it's apocalyptic. Or, I, 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 unless you really have a des deep desire to study uh, apocalyptic literature, you can certainly use that. Uh, but nonetheless, your favorite, you think about your favorite verse. It'd be easier to gain the disciplines through your favorite verse. Okay? Marinella, anything I, I missed uh, on those two things? Okay. Uh, she's my backup. Thank you. Uh, any questions at all? Uh, I'll be around for a few minutes afterwards. If you don't want to ask something for public consumption, it's quite all right. Um, yes? I couldn't hear you. I, I, can someone, like this voice thing here, why don't you yell it forward? What did she say? Bring enough paper to make notes. Bring enough paper to take notes? Well, they're both, you can use both sides. I think the other side is empty as well. Okay? Uh, you may want to use other paper you have at home for your own study purposes. Uh, nonetheless, remember at 6.30, Marianella will be here to go over your homework. You say, why do I need that for? Uh, this is foundational to being able to understand the scriptures. If you don't get this right, the rest of it will get more confusing. And so get this stuff down, get a thumbs up on the fact that you did it right, that you knew where the verb is, what the verb of this verse is, you know, what the subject of the verb was, verse was, and all of that, uh, the adjectives, etc. Uh, and that will be just a starting point, okay? And then we'll go into uh, other things that will be getting your minds really uh, impacted by, by the scripture, okay? This was our introductory time together. Uh, no one has any questions, everything clear as, okay, so there's homework every week. You are going to do homework every week. I figure about half of you won't be here next week. That's okay, uh, this is, you know, it's not required for salvation, it's okay. Uh, but if you want to get the most out of this course, uh, you really want to do your homework and you want to do it consistently uh, so that you can grow into these matters and not just have it all kind of like confusing and too much to do at once. So homework for next week, 6.30, be here with your homework. At 7 o'clock, we, we continue on our merry way. No questions? Okay. Okay. Uh, this is, we'll be, have more outlines, but this is the paper we'll provide. If you need more writing paper, bring your own notebooks, whatever you wish, or your pads or laptops, whatever you wish. All right. Okay, well, let's close in prayer. For those at home, if you have questions, uh, just there's a way to chat. You can chat with us on that matter. Let us know. Uh, 
able to do your homework. I don't know how we're going to do your homework, but we'll try to be as helpful as we can be. Let's pray. Avina, we thank you for the truth of your word, that your word is truth. Help us to understand the truth and to apply the truth uh, that the truth might then set us free. Help us to keep from misapplying the truth, which only can put us in greater bondage. Guide us in this process of growth and maturity. Guide us. We pray that the Holy Spirit would encourage our hearts. Even the simple lessons we'll be doing for next week, guide us in this process. In Yeshua's name, amen.